Cool. Perfect. Good. All right. Well, there's no official start, so um, <laughs> <laughs> abandon ship. Welcome, welcome to to the show. It's a real pleasure to to chat with you. Um, where did the name come from? It's a great name, and uh, I, I I wonder whether you've all sort of come from a journey of being on a ship together, and then someone shouted <laughs> abandon ship. I mean, you must have heard that joke all the time. But where did the name come from? Um, there's a band called The Receiving End of Sirens, and they have a song called Dead Men Tell No Tales. And the top line of the chorus is abandoned ship. And I just liked it. And then I was like, should we call our band abandoned ship? And that was it really. Well, I was expecting so, yeah. a really big story. Oh, yeah. this thing happened it's... to us this time ago. Then we were all, we were saved <laughs> and we just. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty underwhelming actually. We, I think we had a name before we had a band. I think, I think when Clayton joined, we were like, this is what the band's going to be called. You this don't is abandoned ship. This is abandoned <laughs> ship. Oh, right. There was so only two of us at that stage. I mean, you didn't give Clay an, an opinion around no. it. No, not at all. No. He doesn't no. really get it. No. <laughs> no. I'll just sit in the background. He's just the driver. <laughs> pop, pop, pop up when, I, when I'm needed. <laughs> you know, I've spoken to a few pans. You know, why is it that everyone coats off the bass players? Coats <laughs> off. <laughs> e we're easy targets, that's why. <laughs> but you're but you're an instrumental yeah. integral part to the to the show <laughs> to the sound wow well, everyone, yeah, everyone, everyone, everyone gives it. gives gives you a uh, hell as the as the um, as the full guy it's because most bass guitarists start off with being guitarists and then it just turns out that i'm the worst guitarist out of the three <laughs> of us so i <laughs> i've um i'm been demoted to four strings now which is a bit easier to play <laughs> <laughs> There are bass players in the world who would see that that comment. Oh, I know. <laughs> that, that's a former guitarist. Yeah. Speaking. <laughs> what's what's no, your I, I, Go on. Sorry, I, I've got into bass a lot more recently. You also have the biggest oh. hands, so I think it's like... Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense, it? It makes sense biologically. Long, stretchy fingers. You were also named after a bass player, so a bit of, bit of history yeah. there, you know. That yeah, Adam sense. Adam Clayton from U2, the bass guitarist. So yeah, back when U2 was me me meant to be. <laughs> yeah, hey, I didn't realise that Clay. Yeah, yeah, that's where the parents' name got the name from. Adam Clayton, U2, bass guitarist. That's it's really it's funny how they wasn't it? on the name Clayton, isn't it? People was like Clayton. That's a funny name. Yeah, very American, I think. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's your journey and when did you start? Um, you, you've already got a really established sound and you know you listen to some of your singles which are on Spotify and your EPs and um, it, it sounds really mature, um, a little bit like 1975 or so, I think that's what you're getting compared to. Just really mm. great to listen to. Well, how did it all start? Um, so I think maybe like three years ago or so, so Jordan and I met in college and we played in a few bands, etc. And then um, once we left college, we uh, kind of just didn't chat for a, about a couple of years or so. But then we just got in contact. We, were, we always go to this bar called Sanctuary in Basingstoke, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which was like where they would have gigs on. It was kind of the only place to put shows on. So we'd like to see each other there a few times. Then we kind of started to um, hang out again and, and just write music, just the two of us really, just in my bedroom, just two guitars type thing. Mm. And yeah, and then we had like three or four, like not songs at this stage, but just like instrumental, like guitar bits, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And then, um, and yeah, and then we were like, okay, we should try and start a band. And then um, we didn't know anyone that plays bass. My friend Stephen was playing bass originally, um, but he was, but he moved to Australia. And we had like, we, we kind of just thought, okay, well, we, we've, you know, it's a relatively small town for like musicians here. So we we're kind of thinking, oh, this probably won't actually end up in a band. But then Jordan was friends with Clay and he played guitar. And then he put this video on Instagram of him playing like a Biffy Clyro song on guitar. So I was like, <laughs> why don't we ask Clayton if he'll play bass? And then Jordan was like, but he plays guitar. I'm like, meh. But then he did play bass, so it worked out. And he was well keen for it. And yeah, yeah and then Martin, uh, Martin used to go to Sanctuary a lot. I've known him since I was quite young. And then um, and we just asked him and he was like, sure. And yeah, then we kind of started from there, really. We've probably been, it's probably been the four of us for like a couple of years now, I think. So I think we're starting to 
have an idea of what we want to sound like and what direction we're heading in, you know. Because it takes it takes time to figure out what you what you kind of want to achieve as a band. Like I think when we mm. first started, we kind of had our ambitions of being like a loud rock kind of pop punk band, you know. But I think now, as we've kind of played music together and maybe with the in terms of what we'd listen to, we're kind of becoming a bit more original in our sound in, in sound now, you know. It's a bit less generic than maybe when we first started out. I think I think most bands take a, a kind of natural trajectory and get into where where they are where they where they end up sounding like how they sound you know and it takes a kind of it takes some time to discover what you want to sound like you know what what, what influences that natural trajectory as you say obviously playing together more often recording together building your own relationship listening yeah. and getting feedback what is it that helps you figure out the right direction for you to go in a good question i think pre- musical preferences is a big one like, yeah we're all very aligned with the bands we listen to yeah um and that that has a big uh, that helps massively um we all go to gigs together as well so it's, it's i think it's number one thing is is uh us being a unit and and kind of doing stuff together so yeah yeah we're quite fortunate we all have similar taste in music really so i think yeah we we naturally just tend to listen to a lot of indie music arctic monkeys um foals and small bands as well called Mas- like masticans and stuff so i think it's easiest to play and enjoy the music you enjoy listening to really mm. i think that's where yeah where we started off like luke said earlier started off more of a like heavier, well, not heavy, but a bit more punk, punk, pop punk. Yeah, it was kind of just um, straight guitar rock, you know. Where yeah, we like a lot more elements, you know, a lot more instrumentation, etc. You know. Yeah. And it's just better. <laughs> now, when you've been getting influenced by different bands, so do you? Obviously, you've got a passion for for this type of music, anyway. Of course, going out to gigs, like when you're going out as as mates and listening, where where do you go and get? Like, do you go to different festivals? Where do you normally go when you're going out? Out? Where do you normally go to to listen out, to your out. music? Out? Out? There's obviously <laughs> in, right? There's, you've you've got your out, which is just you're going out in town, and then of course you've got your mm. out. Out. <laughs> I forgot what that's like. <laughs> yeah, it's been too long. It's been a long time. Purple towel yeah. and metal. Yeah, we can't go anywhere in Basingstoke anymore. The, the scene no. has kind of died. So I was um, thought you were going to say because you get mobbed. No, <laughs> <laughs> I did get recognised once outside Fever, which was cool. It's the only time that ever happened. That was a bad mistake. <laughs> So Pur- um, Purple Turtle is pretty iconic, isn't it? For I say yeah. iconic in some respects locally, because a lot of us love to go there, listen to bands, and and obviously get drunk. Um, mm. You've have you you've played there a few times? I'm going to say, are you? Once? Yeah, we've yeah. got some shows there. We've yeah, a few like, times. We've headlined there maybe twice, three times, I think. Mm. And um, mm, yeah, what's yeah. it like playing there? Because that must be quite a good crowd to play to. Yeah, it's always sick. It's always really good. It's kind of like our home venue, so that's the one that we like probably pull most people to. Um, so yeah, it's always a pretty good time, especially if it's on a Friday or Saturday. But yeah, it's it's a fun venue to play. It's like it's quite an interesting venue because because it's like the Purple Toe itself is quite a big bar, and the 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 band bit is like quite a small, like portion of it, if you know what I mean. So you get a lot of people that are like there who just turn up like on a night out who are going to end up watching your band, you know, which is kind of cool because then it makes you feel like you're more important than you actually are, which is always nice. <laughs> then there's like more people you can play into more people than maybe are actually there to see you but yeah no it's always good to play there Purple Turtle's got some reasonable size to it I remember I think yeah. the first time I saw you the first the time I saw you was 2008 was it White Hart? In 2008? 2008 2008 <laughs> yeah you've been going for uh, a real yeah. long time yeah. and uh, 12, 12 years, years. Um, uh, none of you were, were even old enough to go into a pub probably by then <laughs> no uh, no 2018 a couple of years ago wasn't it maybe and, yeah and that and was white heart. clay was it like white yeah. heart basically. yeah the white heart and that was packed oh. yeah that, night. that was rammed it was yeah it was hard to stay inside it was so busy yeah. Oh, yeah. That was one of the first shows we put on ourselves, wasn't it? That was one of the first. Headlines. I think so. I think it was the first one we, yeah, actually put on ourselves. Oh, was that when headlines. it was really snowy? And I think maybe I don't know. We played there a few times now. Yeah, it's yeah. always a good, 
always a good crowd there. Yeah. It's, well, it's local. It's on a Saturday night. You can get all your friends and family down. So. Yeah. Always pull a decent crowd. Mm. Yeah. Which is sick. So let's talk about what happened after that. So 2018, got, got it right then. 2018, <laughs> you, uh, one of your first gigs was playing at the White Hart Basingstoke. And then you've gone on to, to, to play at some really great venues, you know, join us in Southampton, et cetera, I think. And of course, you're, you've been in a bit of competition to get into Isle of Wight Festival. So it's really gone to strength and strength. You're getting a lot of views on, on YouTube and a, a real high, a really high amount of listens to you on, on Spotify. Um, and then, of course, now you've been, uh, you've been on BBC Radio as well. So it's really going from strength to strength in a really quick, quick way. So talk, talk me through what happened since that 2008 18 <laughs> um what's happened what's been happening in that in that time um what's the journey been like um you're probably best to answer this luke or jordan because you've been there <laughs> oh, longer than me. <laughs> i mean you were there as well mate <laughs> <laughs> well um since 2018 i don't know really we went to the studio um after we well, Luke had written a few songs. Um, yeah, so we, we recorded them, released, released them too on Spotify, which was MIE and Call It Quits. Um, yeah, and then what did we do after that, eh? <laughs> I, know, I think we've just been like progressively putting out music. I think, I think where we've, I think we've got, we've probably learned a lot about uh, recording music as well, because we, our most recent EP, Runga, and we self-produced. Um, and I feel like that was definitely a step forward for us in terms of like our sound. And I think mm. that if you're like on, on Spotify and on the internet, the, our most popular stuff is the most recent EP, which is the one that we produced ourselves. Cause I think it's kind of how we wanted it to sound a bit more than maybe other stuff that we recorded in the past. So I think since 2018, we've probably gone on, um, a, uh, we've kind of gone on a progression, like we've gone on quite a steep learning curve of being kind of just a band with four people in a room. So then, you know, learning how to produce music, learning how to write music better, you know, like learning how to yeah. mix, master, all, all, and all that kind of, all that kind of side to it as well. Because nowadays, it's not like how it used to be. If you go back like twenty years or so, um, there you uh, like you what you do in a band, you'd go to a, a recording studio, you'd go to like a room, and they'd have like a big desk, and then you track everything like on the day, and then you get it back, and then that that would be kind of how it sounds. Um, whereas nowadays, it's different because you can. You know, loads of great music is written just on computers and laptops, you know, and it's not that hard as long as you need a little bit of money to you know, invest in the equipment to get things going. But nowadays it's quite easy for, for kind of anyone to, you know, download mm. Logic, download Reason, download a few synths and then you know, make great music. You know, it's, it, nowadays it's, it, it's easier than ever than it is to write and record music. So the flip side of that is bands are a lot more able to you know you don't need to save up hundreds and hundreds of pounds to go to the studio anymore because you can do you can do a lot of it yourself so i think we've kind of started to figure out you know what we want to sound like inside to kind of go on a journey of producing that way as well i think also our live shows definitely got a lot better which has definitely helped you know we've started we played a show in Bournemouth supporting this band called larkins and it was one of the first shows where afterwards we had like a good reception from the crowd of people actually like investing in our band and like following our band if you know what i mean so we play a lot of shows to like you know like you we mentioned the white heart or purple toe and that's always good fun because we get loads of mates there but it's, it doesn't often help in terms of like actually really like increasing your reach as a band because you're kind of playing to the same people um which is fine because it's always a good laugh but then when we played that show in born support and Larkins, it was like to like a room for like, to, like 100 people that we'd never heard that we'd never met before and, um, mm. and we had like a good reception of our songs, like people following us, people messaging us afterwards, like people were buying teas, you know, streaming our music, you know, and then like on Spotify, you can see like where your streams are. And then afterwards, there was like loads more streams from people that were living in Bournemouth, etc. Um, and yeah, I don't know, really. Do, do you think because, because the way music's changed? Um, it makes you bits better as artists or producers because you've got to go through that process of, like you said, you, you know, you're, you're creating, you're producing your own music now. Do you think yeah. it makes you better musically? Yeah, for sure, um, for sure. I think, um, I think nowadays it's kind of what you have to do as well. I think like most bands, most bands who, um, like 1975, for example, like they mm. they self-produce. You know, they, I mean, they have they have like producers that work with them alongside, but like majority of their work is, is self-produced. Um, I think it just me. It just allows a lot more freedom, you know. You, you don't have to. You, there's no restrictions on when you can and can't write music, you know. 
whereas previously that would have been like a bottleneck for a lot of fans it would be like getting in the studio whereas nowadays you can just do it whenever because also that's a huge thing right because if you're being creative that there's you can't be just creative all the time that you know, yeah. if you're told that guys you've got a slot it's nine o'clock on tuesday morning mm. Oh, all right, well, that doesn't really work for me. But, yeah, but actually, exactly. but actually, a lot of bands maybe you know, you know, maybe you get together late on a Thursday night or a Friday night. But actually, that's when your sound is going to set. You're going to be a lot better because yeah. that's just naturally when you feel more awake or alive or something. Yeah, exactly. So, so the technology developing over the last twenty years, as you say, has, has probably made a huge difference. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I think it's also the be- the beauty of self-producing music as well is that. Like you say, there's no restrictions on, whereas like usually you go to the studio, so you've got a day to record drums and then a day to record bass and like that, that's it. Whereas when you're just recording it from say like Luke or Jordan's bedroom, you can just go keep on going over. If you're not happy with it, just record as many times as you want. It's just a lot more relaxed, I think. And you can, you can have a bit more of a play around with it then as well. Mm. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. we're all uh, all affected by COVID at the moment, but mm. uh, but before then, how did you rehearse? Where did you rehearse? And how frequently? Like, what what were those recording sessions like, or or, or practice rehearsing sessions like? We um, record well. We rehearse in um, Studio Ninety One in Newbury, um, so we we try and do that at least once a week, um, if not twice, um, if we go on the weekends. Um, it's just mm. nice and local. Um, and that's, I mean, we used to practice back in the day um, in Swerve Jam in Basingstoke. Um, but when we heard about Studio 91, the facilities, they, they, I think they just moved and renovated everything. Um, so we started going there. And it's like perfect little setup for bands like us because it's just a small room. You've got a drum kit in there, PA system. Um, so we can just rock up, plug in, and start playing. Um, and we normally do like a four hour session every time. So it, it can be quite intense. But, um, yeah what do you typically like to get out of that four hour session do you try and record something and then play it back so you can keep on you know looking for how you get tighter and how you can improve is that is that the purpose of the session or what do you what do you normally get out of those to an extent i mean it's quite relaxed really but sometimes we'll go in and we'll 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 often go into our like a few days before a show just to kind of get tighter really and we don't really record it so much but we just kind of run over the songs i think maybe in the past it's an area we've probably been too relaxed on and um what we're going to do moving forward is we're going to um we're going to start playing to a, to a track so because on our records on our recordings there's a lot of like samples and you know keys and stuff like that which we're not really replicating live so what we're going to be doing is playing to a track where we can have all that stuff on it and then the drummer will have a click track in there is so um that should hopefully make us a bit tighter but typically what we've done in the past is we've gone in and you know sometimes we've just had a jam and written some music or sometimes we just run our set a few times um mm. but yeah generally it's quite it's, it's quite relaxed we don't we're not too Maybe we haven't been. Maybe this is probably, yeah, as I said, we've, this is probably something we need to do to take our bands to the next level. But we're not. We haven't really scrutinised our performances so much. And where do your ideas come from, and and your vocals, and how do you write write it down, and and then mm. and then also share it with the group? Because I've, I've noticed from talking to numbers of different bands, they all have completely different processes. It's yeah. really interesting for for me, who's not who's not musical at all. It's just that how how you all as a band you will try and find your own special way of working together that that just works for you what's what's your process look like to to get those lyrics out um i don't know really it's kind of different every time most of the most of the songs i think we've put out i'd um we'd either go to a, a practice or, or i'd have like three or four chords and then you know i'd kind of like hum a melody and then I'd go to like a, the band practice and then we'd kind of flesh it out until it's, we've got like a full instrumental song. Um, and then at that point, there's still no lyrics, but I've got like kind of like melodies, like mumbles, you know, so kind of all kind of like filler words. So I'd, um, and then once, once we've kind of like fleshed out the whole kind of instrumental of the song, I'd then like sit down with like an acoustic guitar and then kind of syllabically go through and then try and like fill it out basically as if like, mm. as if there was words to, words to go in there. Interesting. Um, so you always say so the musical element comes first, and then after time, that, yeah. after that, that's when you add the add your lyrics to it. And and yeah. is that those lyrics? Is that something that you're almost constantly writing? You could go out, yeah. go out for a walk, going for a run or something, and you think, oh, yeah, that for sounds, sure, that's a good, just a line just comes to you or something. Yeah, pretty much. I've got on my notes here. I've got like basically just loads of like random lines of just like random lyrics of just like stuff that that comes in. So then what I usually do is once we have an instrumental thing, I kind of just go to this and then. 
So you kind of what topics I was like fleshing can, out. And can you like read that. a few? Can you read a few? It'd be interested oh, to see oh, what's in draft. Go on, it'd be great. I don't know about, about, about that. that. He's on the spot now. Come on, Luke. Yes. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> just, just choose a couple, even if it's draft, because this could be like a sneaky exclusive we could have. Um, okay. Well, the, okay, okay. There's the lyrics to Get Blazed on there, which is a song that we're going to put out soon. Um, well, sorry, one second. You're on some of, some <laughs> of these are awful. <laughs> the I can't is, say these. Li- lyrics, when, when they're just read out, yeah, they, 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 they always sound a bit weird, don't they? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless you're like Bob Dylan or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, here we go. There's one here that just says literally nothing else. It just says, Tonight the city drinks alone. What does that mean? No idea. <laughs> but you know, maybe it's really it's like, in, in, in isolation, it might not mean so much. But then when you put it against the music yeah. and the rest of the words, it will come across as being incredibly profound. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's how it works. It's kind of, it's like, but isn't that also the beauty of writing? Because you know, like, just a bit like poetry, really, it doesn't all have to, you can listen to it, or, but you can interpret, interpret it however you almost want to. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but Bob Dylan once said that good, good lyric writing is just fishing for metaphors, because you know once something's put to a put to a guitar, and you know something's a relatively abstract metaphor, it usually sounds quite profound. So yeah. I, I know, God, when I sing along to Chili's or Arctic Monkeys or whatever, and you're like, mm. you sing along to something without really understanding what it is you're singing along to. And it's only yeah. when you work out and go, <laughs> oh, that's what the song meant. <laughs> yeah. But you just they're just words. Yeah. Yeah, I do every time though. Sometimes it sometimes it flows quite naturally. Mm. Sometimes you'll just be like, we'll just be in a rehearsal room, and then I'll just kind of you know start singing stuff over the top until it's kind of fleshed out. There was ones I think for maybe for one of the songs we got called Table for One. Clayton came to my house, and then we um we kind of worked on it together, just going through it. We had like we had all the syllables of what we wanted, or not not so much syllables, but we had like all the melodies for each part and a rough rhythm, and then we kind of just like kind of try to jam words and you know try to jam lines in that kind of makes sense if if i go to your spotify um you've got a, you've got thousands of followers so for a band that's been together for a for, for quite a short period of time in some respects it's amazing you've got so many so that's mm. that's obviously your, your music's definitely resonating with people in some respects and, and the top most listened to song is wrong again yeah and you know, just not far off 10,000 listens already. Well, why do you think it is that song in particular has resonated? Um, I think it's probably the most commercial in terms of like, it's straight to the hook. So like, there's like an ABC of like pop songwriting, which um, I think stuff like Spotify algorithms and stuff kind of pick up on because it's like straight to, like it kind of starts with like the sample and then it's straight into the kind of the, what you call the hook of the song and then to the verse and it's it probably gets to the chorus quicker than every other one i'd say it's like it's it's like the most perfect pop song probably of all of our songs yeah probably why it's the most popular um yeah and uh, it's also the way it's also the, like the one that we've probably that and say the word which are the two most listened to are the ones we've probably pushed the most as well because that's like the title track of the ep if you know what i mean so i guess if you were going to listen to our band that would be the first one that you'd go to even if you were just checking out and didn't really like it which would then do you know what i mean mm-hmm. And would you say those two songs define you as, as sort of your sound and your band, or is or actually is are they they're just the ones that become really popular? Is, is there other sounds that you think, oh, that's really more us in some respects? I think um, at the time that we recorded them, they probably were. But I think moving forward, our, our sounds probably like starting to evolve into something a bit more, a bit more like I don't know, like more. I don't know how to describe it. What would you? How do you describe it, Jordan? Like the whole like wah pedal, like all yeah, that Australian like, um, kind of vibe. Australian is probably the best way to, to describe it because we've been listening to a lot of Australian music, like bands and stuff. I mean, me and Luke have done for, for years, um, but um, especially over lockdown, that's what I've found. It's been what I've been listening to and it's kind of how we've been writing songs um, for the past six months or so. Um, so we haven't really put anything out um, in that style, but it's that kind of like uh, indie, like reggae vibe type thing like um, bands like sticky fingers ocean alley and that kind of stuff yeah right, I guess a lot of stuff kind of in that vein i mean it's not that dissimilar from the stuff we put out but i'd say that i'd say we're wrong and say the word, but they were kind of a reflection of what, um what we were trying to achieve you know but you know we're, we're, we're i think as a as i think most bands you're always trying to experiment with different sounds and different ideas you know like mm. you wouldn't you always want to try different stuff and 
it's boring if you just do the same thing every time, you know. Yeah, the other thing about those those songs is that um, they've got like quite a lot of synthesizers in them, and mm. um, it was it was kind of the first time that we really um, started experimenting with that kind of thing, and you know uh, I think they were put out nearly a year ago now, um, about half a year ago. So um, we've had a lot more time to kind of explore that, um, uh, you know, those instruments and that kind of music. Um, and I think definitely now, like we could go into a studio and write much better parts of those instruments yeah, and yeah. they sound a lot better. So yeah, they were kind of the first songs that we produced ourselves. So there's like a lot of things where I listen to it now and there's stuff that I would like to have done differently, but where you're just like naive and it's like your first time doing it, you kind of just hammer away at a keyboard and kind of see what comes out. But that's fine though, because it's like a learning process, you know? Mm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You, you mentioned about writing a fair bit for the last six months. Mm. Of course, we've all been in COVID for the last three of those, those months. How's mm. that affected your, your writing and, and, and putting music together? Yeah, it sucks because we can't actually like record or write anything at the, at the minute. I mean, like we can record like uh, ideas and send it to each other. But basically for the process that we record, um, we, we record most things like at home. But for recording drums, we need to go to like an actual studio and have, um, have like an engineer, like mic everything up, etc. Like so it's kind of the one thing that you can't quite replicate. So what we'll, what we'll do is we'll go to a studio for like a day and then we'll track like three or four drum tra tracks for drums, like Four, so, four, so we'll get the drum parts down for like four songs in a day and then once we've got those four, four songs down so that's when then we then you know sit, sit at home and um, twinkle, on, twinkle on guitars etc so we haven't been able to do like much in the way of recording like music for a band ship but we've got like loads of ideas so we actually have a yeah. session book don't we we're going back into we're going to studio night one with a producer called sam winfield to record some music um i think next week next week yeah, today next isn't it yeah. Week today. Yeah. um yeah but we, I mean, we, we yeah, we say we've got tons of ideas, but we haven't been able to like record anything that we could like put out yet. You know, mm. Just it's definitely really pushed good. us to 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 do more. Um, I'd say, yeah, you know, um, being a, not being able to get together definitely made me like, yeah, man, I, I just really want to do it. So I've kind of invested yeah. in some better equipment at home um, and been putting stuff together. I know yeah. Luke's been doing the same. So it's definitely a motivator. I think it's it's one thing you kind of take for granted after you've been doing it for a while. I think you know. Oh, yeah. for sure, yeah. I've, I've missed it so much. Yeah. Just and like you say, you do you do take it for granted. Even just like when just go meeting up for a practice, going for a yeah. beer after. It's just yeah, exactly. Yeah. All it's part of the fun. That yeah, exactly. that part must be because you all live reasonably close together, right? So that just just that social element because of course you're a band you must spend a lot of time together so just yeah having time together you know talking about music trying to write stuff down just that must mm. be really difficult because it must yeah. be quite absent for you to think oh god we just can't even meet up and do anything yeah, yeah for sure it's also like it sounds well cringe but it's like it's like when you meet people they like know you as the guy who's in a band and that's that's like and nowadays it's, it's like a talking point when you meet like chat to people but whereas like now it's like i'm definitely like not as interesting you know? <laughs> and like, your hair's weird you know what i mean <laughs> none of us are particularly interesting while we're while we're sat at home no like, exactly you know? um however the, the pubs we're going to get are going to get really interesting today um yeah. <laughs> um uh, but uh because I, I think uh it's the first time people can go out are, are you any of you going to go out for a drink today or are you going to stay 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 away i don't know i'm staying away <laughs> um, i'm going to stay away for a good while i think yeah, it'll be so hard to like actually get a drink, but yeah. I don't know. What about you, Simon? Are you going to go? It's uh, an it's anniversary weekend, so we've got a few oh, people really? coming over. Yeah. Oh, nice. Fact. So, uh, funny enough, Clay's Clay's mum is coming in for lunch. Oh, today. really? <laughs> oi, oi. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, all above board, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my wife, my wife will be there clapping. <laughs> and, uh, no bless her so yeah so, so we just got some family coming around today so it's a year ago we got we got elena and i got married oh, um, nice. so um yeah it's really cool so we're just gonna we're stay at home um talk, mm. talk to me about your favorite gigs and festivals because of course um i think i'm pretty sure to say you, you played was it uh, tramline yeah you played yeah, tram, tramline fringe festival and that that had quite a lineup i think noel gallagher was headlining am i gonna say is that right yeah, I think so. That's right. Yeah, no Gallagher. How was that? Is that one of one of um up in Sheffield, isn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was cool. But when we played there, we were like first band on at like 12 o'clock and there was no one there. It was still, <laughs> it was still cool to play there, though. But yeah. Cool to say it was that. A, it was cool a funny day. There. But it was, yeah, it was, it was still a good day. But it's like, yeah, we didn't play to many people. But it's still cool to say that we still say that we played it, you know. That's interesting. Do those types of gigs help you or are they a little bit challenging because you do end up playing so early and people come a bit later because yes, you've got no Gallagher, yeah. Stereophonics, et cetera, they're, they're headlining. Um, hmm. so it's great you can say you've played with them, but does that help Real Gill Brand in some respects? Or? I think it's maybe like a rite of passage that you have to kind of have to go through as a band, you know. Like I remember, um, Jordan, you, when you first saw Easy Life, there's a, there's a very big band that I'm sure you've heard of them called Easy Life, which are like, they made like a pretty astronomical rise in the last couple of years or so. And then um, Jordan saw them first at a truck festival in 2018 or 2017, I think. Yeah. And there they, was they like had no one midday. there. Yeah. yeah. They were the first band on, on the Sunday um, midday. There was no one there. It's just one of those things where you kind of, we was out looking to get some breakfast and we just stumbled into a tent and they were playing to like 10 people, yeah. um, you know, and now they're massive. Yeah, I think it's, it's, everyone goes through that stage. I think is um, you need to learn your trade, and um, a promoter is not going to book you like a really sick slot if they if you've never played a festival before. You know, <laughs> so it's like it's kind of like training. I think you know, if you're um, if you're like a footballer, you know, you um, your man. If even like even if you've heard someone's good, you're not going to put them like straight into the first in to the first team without seeing them play before. You know. I think promoters and um, agents is kind of a similar approach. Do they want to take on artists that are, you know, have had a repertoire of playing shows yeah. for like a couple of years at, you know, relatively reputable festivals that are still getting booked, you know? But Interesting yeah, that yeah. you use that analogy of football because, yeah, you're right, people have got to come through the ranks and that's, yeah, exactly. that's really, really relevant to, to people coming through the ranks of music where, you know, sometimes you're going to have, you know, the beginning of your career, your musical journey, you are going to end up playing playing to, to, to rooms where maybe there's this not not your ideal so there might be just a few people there or a handful of people there hmm. but then that earns the right of passage I think that's a really good explanation of the right of passage to then get to play the bigger gigs um, yeah, yeah, where's, exactly. where's your favourite like where, where's if you think about the last few years where you have been playing where have those better gigs been probably Purple Toe I think um, my, my favourite was um, we played a show in oh where was it somewhere in London um, oh, Tooting um, Tram, it's a Tooting Tram. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That was my favourite because the, the venue itself was like so cool. Um, yeah, it was the, cool, yeah. the way it was set out at the stage. Um, and actually, we ended up getting a fair few people in there in the end. So that was definitely my favourite. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, Purple Turtle was right up there. But I think that's just because it's so local and it, like we usually play there on a Friday or a Saturday, get all your mates down. But, um, yeah, that that London menu was up there. It was cool. One. Yeah, probably Purple Tail for me. Just there always, just a good time. And also, it's like it looks like the, like in pictures. There's always a lot of people there, so it kind of looks better. It's better for the ego, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the ego, which is what it's all about. And of course, you've been you've been. Obviously, everyone knows about Isle of Wight Festival, and of course, it hasn't hasn't ha- transpired, hasn't happened this year. But I think, mm. am I right in saying you you were in a the, the New Blood competition, and you were you got through? I'm going to say the quarterfinals um, mm. to be chosen to to win a place to be able to play there. What actually happened? Did that kid go ahead on the fifth? Fifth uh, of March was the quarters. I think. Uh, so. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we were there. Oh yeah. yeah, it went really bad actually. Oh yeah. no, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. that's ba- probably why we haven't spoken about it since yeah. the last socials, isn't it? <laughs> basically, basically. I'm so sorry to have brought it up. No, no. It's <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Like, that. Thanks, thanks, little like Spurs on Thursday night last week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like Sheffield game. United. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, it was um, it was one of these things. It was all about how many people you got through the door, um, which as to kind of like get to the next like level. Um, and it was on a Thursday in um, in like a like kind of out out of town bit of place in London, and we just didn't get enough people in basically. And the other bands were all from London and just brought more people. So yeah, we yeah. played like early and didn't we played like early to no one. So it was a bit awkward, but it was alright. Every gig, gig's a gig, and it? it's all a 
and is that, the grind. And is that yeah. what, how you see it really? It's just, you know, this is another gig, it's another opportunity to try and build an audience, be a crowd, but you're not really yeah. that bothered about winning because you know a lot yeah. of these things, a lot of these types of competitions actually are weighted based on who gets the most amount of people there. Yeah, exactly. Of course it's, it's, am I right in saying it's, it's the crowd that make the decision on who wins? Yeah, so it's, 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 it's basically whoever yeah. gets there makes their most, like, makes their, like, if we were, like, doing it in Reading, like, it would have been completely different because we would have had all of our friends there. Hmm. Um, but, where, but where it was on, like, a Thursday, it was kind of hard for us because we don't have that much of a following in London yet. Like, most of the people that come to see our gigs are kind of, like, Southampton, Basing, so Reading kind of area. Um, or on, unless it's on, like, a Friday or Saturday. So, yeah, if it was, like, uh, in Reading, it probably would have gone a bit differently. But yeah, I think you, um, you, you know, even if even if even if the gig doesn't go well, it's still like a learning experience. It's still like a free band practice, you know. And it it makes the ones that do go well even better, really. Yeah. I mean, you've got to have the bad ones to appreciate the good, really. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. they're all worth doing. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And and thinking back to Be Love, which was July 2019. Mm. And uh, you're on the lineup with bands that I know quite well because I've, I've chatted with them with Reawaken, who I spoke to recently, Delayed Departure. Do you guys all know each other? As you know, you're you're on the same lineup. But I always I'm always interested to see what happens behind the scenes. Do you, you know, obviously you've got um, Familiar Spirit, Buds, Mella, so oh, Luna okay, Kings. Yeah. We know They're all, um, all we bands know that have played on the amp stage over the weekend of Be Love. Yeah, mm. we know Buds very well. We um, they're our mates. Um, we also know Mella, they're our friends as well. But other than those two, I don't really think we know many of the other bands. I think it's just no, those two, I mean, those two that we're mates well, with. We haven't really played any shows with the other bands, have we? No. Uh, same venue on the same night kind of thing. No. Um, Buds and Mella, we've played with a fair few times, I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're good pals. Yeah. I think there's like a stylistic clash with bands like you mentioned Reawaken. But I just don't think we'd we'd ever be on the same show, on the same bill as them just because of like the genre that we are. Mm. You, you are know? quite you are very different. Yeah. Mm. Both both um, brilliant, but just really different. In diff- different crowds. They're they're more similar to Evanescence. You're more similar to nineteen seventy five. Yeah, exactly. And you know, those two just you know, if you think about think about that they, they wouldn't really tend to be on the same lineup. They're quite different. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um yeah, but yeah, sure. both we played a few shows with like they're in a they're, they're, the lads and buds were um used to be in a band called We Design and the other others were in a band called Kill Quebec. We used to play in Bays and Soak a lot. Um and yeah, when when I was like eighteen they were really scarred together a fair bit. What's your so, yeah, what's your view on the B Love Diggy? Was it a good festival or what what sort of gig was that? Yeah, twenty nineteen, yeah, it was sick actually. It was it was good fun. Um we had a decent crowd. I think we had the well, John Lovego, the promoter, said that we had the best crowd that they had in that tent over the whole festival. So that was good. That's cool. I mean, it's, <laughs> maybe because you're local. Um, yeah. So you had a whole bunch of your mates there. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, because the band that headlined were a band called Holding Absence and they're like a legit, really big band. Um, but I watched them and there was like no one there. I felt kind of bad for them actually because they're like a proper good band. But um, yeah, it was, it was fun though. Yeah, as I said, so those kind of shows were like quite easy for us because, you know, you get all your friends there. You know, your mates there. Uh, I don't know how relevant they are for like actually boosting your like status as a band because you know you what, what like the ideal situation for I think the stage we're at now is we we need to be playing shows with bands where we're getting in front of people who've never heard of us who are kind of into our kind of music. So we need to be like playing with you know like-minded indie bands who are kind of maybe like a few years ahead of us who are getting a lot of people to their shows. And maybe we need to be like the opening act or something like that. I guess the the kind of next stage in um, where we we're aiming to get to, you know, try and get on a tour with a band. Yeah. Um, Best way to build your following, really, isn't yeah. it? Playing with similar bands who, yeah, you know, like you say, have a big following. Yeah. So how how do you make that happen? Forgetting COVID or whatever, but how do you yeah. then? What's the process for you to get onto those types of lineups, the right type of lineups for you? Obviously, I know you've got got a sort of a management team as well. How do you make that happen? Um, I think like. There's a lot of luck to it and just knowing the right people. Um, yeah, I think, you know, being relevant, like people are, people are going to want to book a band that, um, that, are, that are active and are doing a lot of stuff. Um, mm. Like if you're a promoter think... you're, and you're like, you're worried about, often, often, you, often people would put a support act on when they're like 
they've sold like 75 percent of tickets so they're going to want to they're going to want to book a band that are going to still bring people as well you know or and yeah just about getting in with the right crowd putting out music which people like and just being a, an active busy band you know messaging promoters messaging and just i think be just being as active as you can just doing as much as you can as vague as that sounds but i think there's no i don't really know if the, i don't think there's i think it's like being in a band or doing music generally there's no like one there's no one way of doing anything like it's, it's like that whole thing of you know your route to being successful is like you start you go up a bit and then it goes down again you know it's like that whole squealy line thing that whole analogy um yeah i don't know i, think, I don't know there's, i think there's no right or wrong way yeah, that's interesting because you're right. I don't think there is because something great could happen for you, then then nothing happened for a couple of weeks, or you know, you, you, it is that squiggly line. You could be going um, b- before you really find where, where where you need to be. But no doubt, being on places like BBC Radio, it, it's or BBC Berkshire, is going to make a huge difference. What was that like being on on that show? Yeah, it was fun. It was cool. Um, yeah, they played the wrong song, but. That's right. <laughs> Did they really? <laughs> yeah, was, Did they really? Well, that was fine. <laughs> yeah, well, was it at least one of your songs? Yeah, it was one of our songs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I said, that'd I be embarrassing, wouldn't that'd it? That'd have been awkward, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> basically, um, the way that happened is one of the um, artists, I, pr- I produced this guy called Chris Holden, if, you might, if you've heard of him. So I uh, record and produce his stuff. And, um, and he was on there. And then he was like, you should check out this band, Abandoned Ship. And then he gave the presenter a copy of our EP. And then, um, and yeah, and then when, when, when we were there, she like, she'd been like, he, he like gave it to her on a USB with just like the WAVs. So she just did, like, didn't know what the title track was or anything. I actually literally just been given like a set of songs. So, um, so when we were there, she was like, cool. Um, and then I'll play your song and then played a clip of it. And we just assumed it was going to be wrong again. Cause that was like the lead, the, the title track. But then Clayton was like, that's not wrong again. And I was like, <laughs> shit, no, it's not. So, um, and we were like about to introduce it as well. So it would have been really awkward if we were like, and this is a band of shit and this song is called Wrong Again. And they just played a different song. It would have been really bad. But fortunately, she played this one little extract, like as like a kind of brief, as like a rehearsal, sorry, of how it's going to go. And then I was like, okay, well, when it's too late to like change it to get the actual song in. So we'll just put, we'll just introduce Better Days. And then, yeah. So that was the song they ended up playing, which is why, which, which is fine because it was off our new EP anyway, you know. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so frustrating, isn't it, that you do all this work, but then you get there, <laughs> yeah. and literally at a click of a button. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it it could have could have gone great, or, or or of course maybe maybe the wrong. At least it's still your song being played. I suppose if you look on the real positive. Yeah, exactly. Side. It could have been. It might have, which you just got the wrong band in. That could have been really bad. <laughs> oh, this is awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and is it quite nice to be starting to get recognised by, you know, the likes of BBC um, and, and starting to get a bit of coverage more, 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 more on that sort of platform? Yeah, for sure. I think it definitely, like, it definitely works as a motivator. I, I often wonder how, like, how much it really helps in terms of, like, getting new fans. Because I'm not sure many people that um, would listen to our music would, like, maybe be listening to that show. But, I, but, I, I mean, that's, that, but that's the wrong way to kind of think about it. It definitely, like gives you some kind of legitimacy of the work you're doing you know it kind of reaffirms that your efforts aren't totally wasted well i, th- I think yeah. it's all um it, it's validation isn't it if bbc yeah. have recognized you that means you're a recognized band by the bbc that that almost in, in some respects gives you a bit of kudos about it in some respects or puts you on a, onto a different level because if you weren't recognized by the bbc um mm. then you'd have one less thing to say about yourself almost and i think with all these types of little bits of marketing it's mm. just a little one percent, little thing. Yeah, exactly. Not, one thing in isolation won't make any difference. Yeah. But lots of things cultivated over many years makes a huge mm. difference. One percent yeah, better every day than than yeah. suddenly you're 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 huge. In twelve months' time, you're you're hugely uh, fast forward. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Because also it it kind of it helps for like content when you because when people go on like our Facebook page, it kind of it shows that we're not a band that have like just started doing stuff or. You know, it it shows that there's a bit like for promoters and getting on shows, etc. It gives you a bit more of a of a grounding or of a reason to book someone, if you know what I mean. But you're totally right. It's about it's about doing like if you do, if you look at these small things in isolation, then there's often not it, 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 like there's not like one groundbreaking impact that anything would have. But over like a, over like a whole campaign of doing those things is when you start to see hopefully start to see results. 
going, going back to sort of when you you're playing out you're playing out live before I think you played at open house Delhi in Winchester mm. which is quite a different type of gig you know we're talking about playing at some of these bigger festivals yeah but here you're playing quite an intimate show do, is, do you have a preference I mean this it sounds like um, you know playing some of the playing at this particular intimate show was you know would, 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 would have been really good you really connected to your fans i suppose in some respects as well yeah well it's actually interesting because we weren't actually playing to any any abandoned ship fans there so much so it was a safer sounds gig so um, i'm not sure if you're familiar with those those format but basically the way sofa sounds work is um they sell out before they release a lineup like so it's it's they're basically the they're, i guess they're kind of like a promotions company and they film it and it's all very zen but they often get like acoustic or, or they get bands to do like an acoustic set in like a random location. Mm. And it's all very like Zen and kind of hippie vibes and everyone kind of sat on the floor, et cetera. But they said, but they said, so they'll, so they'll put on a show. They'll be like, cool, we're doing a show on this date and then we'll book tickets and they won't even have a lineup yet. Like it's mental and they always sell out. So we were, um, so we got asked to do it. Like it was kind of last minute, I think. Um, and yeah, and we're playing to like a bunch of people that we uh, didn't know or like didn't know us, but it was just me and Clay actually on the day as well. Um, and yeah, it was fun. I mean, I don't think they'll ask us back, but it was still fun, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we, we, I think we were only told like a couple of days before as well, because they had a band drop out. Yeah. Um, which we replaced. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so me and Luke were like, oh crap, we've, we've got to, like, we've to, got to try and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, try and do some sort of acoustic set. So we were like, just sat in his room the day before yeah like, what, what should we do just <laughs> add a couple of acoustic guitars and just like right, wait, let's just wing it yeah it, it was very um, much better. i mean it was fun it was fun though um with, it was yeah with, with having almost no time to prepare how do you put to yeah how, how do you even start to put together what your set's going to be and do you just think right it's going to play these three or four because i know they're they're, 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 they're the big hitters or they're, they're known on spotify or like, how do you how do you choose because also you probably don't really know the audience that well I'm no. they're going to be sat on the floor <laughs> yeah exactly um i don't know really we kind of just probably winged it clay and played guitar um despite not having played guitar for a, a, a while being promoted from bass congrats yeah <laughs> yeah he's back yeah. down now um, yeah <laughs> i think it could have gone worse it could have gone better i think if we had more time it would have been better but i think it was okay i yeah i think i, I think, think so, we and, um certain songs translate better acoustically as well um, yeah. and with, with with our songs you've got ones which are like almost written in that way so that you can play them like that or you've got ones where we've spent a lot of time like on the production and it's very difficult to, to get an acoustic version of that so yeah yeah we we, we one of the songs went down didn't it um when we played we that we played get blaze that went that went down quite well but um oh, yeah say the word wasn't so good what was the other song we played? We played Cyclone and something else? Cyclone and NYE Acoustic, NYE. Which, is our, yeah. which is on our EP anyway, as an acoustic yeah. version. So yeah. that one didn't take much thinking about. Yeah. My housemate said he liked it, so that's good. <laughs> well, people can go onto YouTube and they can subscribe and they can see some of your, your music videos as well that you've created. Um, mm. So... One of the ones that I was uh, I was watching recently, say the word, mm. just Clayton. I just need to pick up with you. Uh, Luke's mm. there singing away, sounding fantastic. And you're just sat next to him reading the newspaper, and yeah, I just yeah. feel like you need to work a bit harder. Face <laughs> 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 way of behaviour, that isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that was a funny. Um, so we actually recorded that video in um, a little industrial unit near Basingstoke. Um, I did some electrical work on it and I, I asked the owner, I was like, oh, do you mind if we shoot a music video here? He said, oh, well, the people are moving in in a week or two's time. So as long as you do it before then, that's fine. <laughs> so we literally managed to do it, squeeze it all in on a Monday evening, I think it was, or something like that. Mm. And um, obviously with a full acoustic drum kit um, and there were houses quite nearby and the, the drums kept going, I think we till about, one or something like that was it we still making yeah noise? there was definitely some noise complaints as well yeah um, we got a phone call from the guy he was like are, are you are you going to stop playing drums soon because it's it's gone midnight and i'm doing <laughs> drums in my house <laughs> <laughs> like, oh sorry yeah <laughs> uh, that, that was a good back, laugh comes back to one of our original points is about on you know you don't want to play music at uh, nine o'clock on a tuesday because you've got to 
you've got to um yeah exactly uh, but here you're, you're playing at midnight on a monday which no doubt to, um, <laughs> yeah some of the residents might not become your your, your biggest fan. talk me through that video cause it's a really great concept it's really cool uh where basically clayton was like i've got this unit which we can use and then we were like cool let's go and then we didn't even really have a plan we just turned up and then just that was what that was what we did we literally we, we turned up with some red balloons um we read it from, from luke's place <laughs> Um, yeah, some furniture, and then actually we need to give a shout yeah. out to our mate Jordan Garwood, who filmed it for us. Oh, for sure, who's a legend. Legend, and then this guy Nathan Mountain um, edited it as well, who's also a legend. But yeah, it was like it was we, it was super, just like last minute, like we've got the space to so try and do something, and then yeah, and then that was what came out of it. I think it's alright. I think considering we spent zero pounds on it, it's alright. Um. I think moving forward, well, we're going to... I think we spent, we spent about 50p on some red balloons, didn't we? But... Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> My bad. Let's not, I I... not forget them. Yeah, I think it's... You, you, used, to, you used to loan me for them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's um, 12, 12p each or something like that. Something like that. Um, yeah, I think, I think moving forward, though, we're going to kind of hit the music video stuff a bit harder and um, start to... We're going to, I think we're going to approach some, some proper directors and for our next batch of recordings and then hopefully... I think we're going to invest a bit more in the marketing side of it because I think that's one area we kind of never really have invested that much in. Mm. Like a lot of a lot of being in a band nowadays is doing a PR campaign and get making sure people hear your stuff because it's fine like it's fine writing like a great few tracks, but if no one hears it, then that's kind of that's bad, you know. Or that or then there's kind of no point to it. I think that's one area we've definitely been rela too relaxed on in the past is we've kind of like, we've recorded music and then just kind of like put it out and then just, just you know, not really pushed it enough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think plan wise, we're going to do some more music videos, um, hopefully to a, like uh, a more kind of professional level. Does, it make, does that make it quite a big difference in terms of how people, how you're perceived by people or how, um, your fans kind of engage with you when they see a music video is that diff do you, you know is, is that what's my question does that does that pro project you in some respect as a band moving forward i think i so. think, I think it, it does do them. oh yeah i was just gonna say it does in a, in a certain extent and there are there are loads of bands now which like indie bands in particular that are just making stuff themselves and getting just as as far you know um so i think traditionally like yes if you have a high quality music video you're more likely to be seen but nowadays it's more about quantity of content rather than quality i'd say i think, mm. I think the tables are kind of turning um and actually putting out making a music video for six songs on an album rather than just your two singles um is what most bands are doing now um so, yeah. And what, that's an interesting one. Just the fact because we are all living in a world which are which is social media heavy, <laughs> you could mm -hmm. say the least. So is it just a matter of you've got to keep on producing, keep on updating every few days or whatever with more and more content? Just because this competition is so so rife in some respects. Mm. It's yeah, it's, it's a fine line I'd say because you know we still want quality videos. Um, but we also know that we need we need to put out more content, so um, yeah. finding that balance. Yeah, for sure. I think one of, one of the criticisms of bands is compared to like hip hop artists. Hip hop artists they uh, it's, they put out a lot more songs compared to bands. And I think one of the reasons is because it's kind of easier, not easier as such, but it's the way that they can produce music is often quicker because they can you know get sent a beat by by a beat maker. Um, and then you know do their thing over it, and then that, that's that's kind of the that's kind of it done. Like they don't need the whole process of going to a studio, like we would do to record drums and all, all that. If you know what I mean. Um, and I think you know it's staying relevant is quite important because otherwise you get forgotten about. And you know, just churning out content, it's, and especially mm. nowadays, it's kind of more relevant than ever. I think. Mm. What does what does the future hold? So where where would you like to see yourselves in a few years time is there particular particular venues you want to play at gigs you want to play at festivals you want to play at, at or what what, do you, what does that future look like for you um i think well I think, uh, sorry go on Clem. no that's all right i was just going to say i think the next step for us is to try and get on the festival circuit really some of the yeah some of the smaller festivals um 
maybe like truck festival even would be great to get on um yeah festivals like that just to try and get our music out there to people who are there to listen to music and people who are into a similar kind of genre i guess yeah so um yeah festivals would be a great one to get on and like we said earlier supporting supporting bigger bands um yeah no no venues stick out for me as such i reckon it's just try and yeah just play as many shows as possible as well yeah, yeah, that's it. Some like O2 academies, that kind of thing. That comes with playing with bands that've got a wider reach. So yeah, I mean, We'd, I think the main thing is to get onto a support tour or something. Yeah, we did have a few shows that we were going to play like that with. You know, Red Rum Club. Um, we that we had a we ne- nearly got on their show at um, O2 Academy in uh, Oxford, which would have been sick. But it got cancelled because it yeah. cleared. But no, well, that's fine. Um, yeah. I think that's what Plain says pretty true. It's just to taking it to the next step. Well, well, ages ago, we met... Um, are you familiar with the band Pup, P-U-P? Mm, yeah, um, yeah. So ages ago, Jordan and I, we've been fans of theirs for a while. We saw them at the joiners and there was like five people there. And they still, like, despite only playing to five people, they put on like a really, really great show. And then we were chatting with them afterwards. And one of the things the singer Stefan said to us was he was like, you just need to play as many shows as possible. Like that's that's kind of the only ambition. I think Pup did something crazy, like three hundred shows in one year, and now they're like a really really successful band. That's incredible, was... three hundred shows in one year. So that means yeah. they almost had to go full time as a band because, of course, to get that many gigs, you've got to be going around the country. I'd imagine yeah. so that's, a re- that's that's quite a significant investment. Yeah, for sure. I think it's easier for like I don't think that's that very achievable for UK bands because the cost of playing shows is a lot more in the UK than it is in Europe or over in America because you don't get paid as much for gigs and it's also a lot more expensive to travel and you know there's a few other myriad factors which make it harder for you for to do it over in the UK but I think it's that whole work thing you know like since that show I probably told like over you know 30 of my friends after see after them playing to five people I, I personally must have told like over like 30 40 I don't know, probably more of my friends about Pup who then went on to become fans of them you know and there's that whole domino effect and how many people did those people tell about about part of the band and it all kind of stems from that first like five people they play to and put on a really good show you know like you don't know who your friends are. you know have you seen the film the social network i have yeah um, you know the scene where mark zuckerberg the first thing he creates is comparing him pair, comparing girls to farm animals and he has, there's the uh, there's the one scene there where he says um he sends he and then once he's created it, he sends it's like a mailing list of a bunch of people and then the thing he says to Word 107, the question is, who are they going to send it to? And that's like, and then it's that whole spiraling thing, you know, and that's kind mm. of how fans have started to get spoken about, which is, I think we, that's why there's an importance of, even if you're playing to a really small amount of people to still be really sick and not care that you're playing to five people, you know, because you don't know who they're going to tell about it, you know? It's almost like a little bit like you mentioned at the beginning about that rite of passage where you've got to play a certain amount to get really yeah. noticed to progress i remember on an interview with ed sheeran he said that cause i think he was in london or, or something sleeping on sofas and he, he sings about that in his songs of course he said that he did three years or three gigs three gig pretty much three every night and he just played open night uh, open night night open i can't speak open mic <laughs> nights <laughs> um constantly like for those three years in london he just said he was absolutely exhausted but but mm. then of course if you think about three shows a night for three years you know you're talking like a thousand shows nearly or maybe yeah. more it's like he had to go through that to break through just to get people to listen yeah um, exactly and then he said he, he played at although he was getting he did get to glastonbury he said but he played to no, almost no one he was just playing like in the corners or whatever for for he said he said i think he'd been there six or seven t- 12 times or i can't remember what, what number it was it was quite a high number mm. before anyone takes any notice yeah um so it just seems like there's a huge piece of work that you've got to do there to earn you might be playing the same song at the very beginning because your song's already there and it's polished and you could easily play it on radio mm. today right it's already been played on radio with bbc but to get it to be played on radio one yeah. when of course which will really give you that huge exposure it sounds like you've got to do all this work and it sits in the middle Mm. Um, it's a real big thing for a band, I suppose, to get there and to yeah, get through it. Sure. So, yeah, yeah sure. interesting. It's inter- interesting to, to understand what that journey looks like. And do you do you think it's now become, you know, with the marketing side of of things, like a lot of side time has got to be spent on that, just as much as it has to be creatively, or, or else it's more challenging to be successful. Yeah, definitely. 
yeah, for sure. Um, we had a chat with this guy called uh, Matt Boone, who runs a label called Scruff, Scruff of the. He doesn't run a label. He works for a label called Scruff of the Neck, which are like quite popular kind of in our scene. And um, and one of the things he said to um, he said to us was that when they when they when his label put out a record is they spend just as much on the like so any money they'd spend on a video and recording of their record they would spend a, a minimum of equal that on marketing it so say if they spent like two grand on a music video they would spend that on that's just an example they would spend that on marketing it and getting it in the enemy and all that stuff you know because i think it's, it's you know it's a no, as, as we said earlier, if no one, if you you can make great content, but if no one sees it, then it's all kind of in vain, you know. It's interesting. You you never really know from the outside. Of course, I'm not not in. I don't, I don't produce music or anything, but just I I love music and I consume music every day. Um, mm. And you know, I, all I see is I just get to click on Spotify and then I hear your music. You don't mm. really understand how much goes behind the scenes, how much work there is just to get to that point. Yeah. And then to for you to get a bit bigger gigs, the traveling, the going to the different the, the different shows that you've got to do. It's a huge, huge undertaking and a real commitment sure. as a band. It does that does that bring you together almost as a group of people? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think it's, it, it's, it'd be difficult if we didn't get along, you know, as people. Uh, yeah, you'd be able to do it, would you? You, no. you would just be, yeah, it'd be impossible. When, when we come out of COVID, um, is there, what's the plan? Is, is there, have you been able to sort of book anything in or is there some existing gigs that, that are already there so people can, can get to listen to you? I don't know if there's anything that's that, that far that far booked ahead um we've had a few things we've had a few um actually maybe one festival where they've um where they're just going to carry it over to next year so well they've asked if we can play again next year for the same time and so which um, i'm sure we can as long as we don't have any yet outstanding commitments. so i think a lot of what we have planned will be able to carry over but um other than that not really i think uh, for bands like our size it's kind of maybe not especially difficult, but um, we've like, I don't know what it is, like, because we, we're not exactly about to go sell out like a 2000 capacity venue, right? So there's not like that much of a demand for us to like rebook shows that we've canceled. But whereas I think there's a lot of bigger bands who I've seen, which have like pushed dates back to, you know, December. But whereas I think at our level, it's not like there's, there's not, that much of a demand for it so we haven't really got anything booked yet mm. i think what what's probably going to happen though is when things start opening up again um you know the sort of venues we play are going to be trying to um get started again and so yeah. i'm sure there'll be loads of gigs going um at that time that will be taken up yeah, playing play sure. to a crack, playing to a socially distanced crowd, <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to have to make sure that when you're when you when you're on stage, you have to be at a socially distanced um, perspective as well. Yeah, it's going to be, be it's going to be however that will be. Yeah. Especially with with the energy and running around the stage and everything, yeah. it's going to be hilarious. Yeah, well, gents, gents, it's been a real pleasure in having a chat with you today. So thanks so much for your time. It's been real great to hear about your journey and and some of the songs and everything that that you've written and sort of your creative process as well it's been great to know about that so we're gonna we're gonna have a song to play us out so you've got quite a few out already so let's take a little vote on which song it's going to be you might all choose the same i don't know but um clay clay what would be your your favorite playing out track um oh for me i think i think we'll go wrong again that's my vote (laughs) okay can you go for longer jordan what are you saying yeah same as one again Finally, Luke, I don't, it, it's not even a decision Doesn't now. Doesn't even because, matter anymore. Yeah, because <laughs> would, you, would you have said wrong again? or? Um, yeah, probably. Probably that one. That one will say the word. Mm. Maybe maybe we'll, we'll probably start with say the word. Maybe yeah, it'll be that one. one of those two. All right, who's going to introduce it? Because we, I, have to, I have to leave now because I have to prepare lunch for Clayton's mum. <laughs> <laughs> we were having a barbecue, uh, but uh, well, I think we still are because it still war- looks, looks all right outside. But uh, yeah, everyone's coming over. So fair enough. Listen, gents, um, it's, been nice. a, it's been a real pleasure. Um, Luke, why don't you introduce a song for us, and then uh, uh, then we'll close. Sure. 
Uh, we are a band and ship, and this song is called Wrong Again. Brilliant. Good man. All right, gents. Pleasure meeting you. Take sure. care. Cheers, Simon. Take care. Thank you very much, Simon. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.